Hi, I'm Katie and this is the 13th episode of Ornamentations, which will be a whip party. What is a whip party, might you ask, as opposed to a whip parade? A whip party is when you are a very mon monogamous stitcher who has laughably few whips that would make for a sad and pathetic parade. So instead, you have a party with a lot of enthusiasm to make up for the lack of quantity. Today we will be looking at some of my ongoing Christmas stitching and the first of my, well no actually the first two of my Marie Antoinette Smalls featuring some cross stitch and some surface embroidery as well as talking about future plans and I have the giveaway winner from the last episode to announce, which I actually think I'm gonna do straight off before I forget, cause I just have a feeling that I'm gonna be a little scattered today. And from the previous episode was the RSN Guide to Stump Work, and the winner of that is Barbara, no last name given. I have commented on your comment. Please contact me, send me your mailing address, and I will get this out in the mail to you as soon as possible. And with that, let's get on to the whips. The first of which is from my Christmas stitching. So as I've mentioned before, I am continuing with Christmas stitching year round, doing just a little bit every day in the theory that when Christmas comes around next year, I'll have lots of new fun decorations to go with. And this is Brenda Gervais Burr, It's Cold Outside. Just got my working copy. I couldn't find the original. It's around here somewhere in my pile of charts. So this is Brenda Gervais and this is mine. It's stitched on Legacy Linen, 38 count Fuller's Teasel with a mixture of Swa Goblins, Swa 103, and Accentuate for that little part pop of sparkle, which is, oh God, really difficult to show up. I don't know what it is about my camera, but it just does not want to capture how these things glint in the light. It's a very strong effect in person and it tends to really wash out on camera. And I think you're getting a little bit of it there. So the snowflakes, the trees, the white checks in the snowman's skirt, and then the little pile of snowballs are all accentuate mixed with swell 103. The two threads marry together and that keeps the metallic filaments from splitting so you get all of the sparkle without the horrible headache of trying to keep your thread together. I am using this technique more and more since Lamora of Access Commodities told me about it and I am just loving the results. It just because I'm such a sparkle fiend, that opens up a lot of fun possibilities for me. I added some crystals in the center of the snowflakes and then herringbone stitch in Swall 103 over the broomsticks to replace the back stitch select, suggested by Brenda Gervais. I think it just adds a little fun bit of texture. And then London Dairy Linen for the thread swag instead of the baker's twine in the original piece because I felt like this was more in scale. So you're probably looking at this and going, Kitty, that looks awfully finished. How is that a whip exactly? Well, it is. The stitching is finished on this one. It's been prepped and it's ready for finishing. But I have found, just speaking for myself, that if I finish the stitching on something and I put it away, I never, ever take it back out and do the finishing. And the whole idea here is to have decorations to put out next year. So I have to keep something out and mentally label it a whip until it is a fully finished object. Otherwise, I'm not going to make it a fully finished object. So this is going to become a pillow and then I'm going to do a really fun beaded trim around the edge. That might take a while since some of the beads are on back order, but I am really looking forward to having a full finish on this. I think it turned out beautifully. And these are my colors. I love this accentuate. It's like 
bronzy brownie gold that's the swell 103 i used with it i will list all of the colors for this and my other projects in the description below they are my own work and um one color note so again a lot of gold ones here some swell 103 and accentuate to fill it out so this Goblins 3761, which I used for the burr sign, is an inactive color that I pulled from Stash because I do generally stitch from Stash. I don't individually kit projects, mostly because I'm generally stitching on something of my own design or when I'm doing cross stitch like for Christmas because I have a lot of thread I just go into the pile and see what works and it's instant gratification to be able to go into stash pull what you need whether you have the exact call for colors or not something that's close enough is usually good enough in my opinion and um, just get stitching out yeah instant gratification I want to do it and I'm gonna start doing it and I love not having to wait for materials so that's one reason why I stitch from stash a lot did have to um, on this one buy the two browns here the accentuate and the swirl 103 to go with it but otherwise stitch from stash and that's why I've got an old inactive color here if you are going to follow my color conversion for where it's cold outside i would recommend giving your local needlework store a call and seeing what they might be able to substitute from probably swallow on under three would be your best bet or you could just use the minty green used for the basket they would work perfectly well for both so that's where it's cold outside which is technically a whip in my book and then I also have my current Christmas project, which is La Di Da, a Merry Christmas sampler, which you've seen before. A lot of floss tubers have done this. And this is where I am with it. I'm pretty far along. I hope to have this finished by my next episode. And I did make a few changes. I felt like I could live without the alphabet, so I just brought the border down to the top. And, um,. I am stitching with a mix of Swa Goblins and Swa 103. And my red, this is Swa Goblins 945, which is a beautiful, beautiful red, but it is a little brighter than the called for. And it's twinging me here. These aren't really doing it for me. I may pull them out and redo them in maybe greens. I think but I will finish the rest of the stitching first and see where we're at um, it can be hard to evaluate until you've got everything filled in and you're looking at the entire piece I have stitched this on legacy linen 37 count wild honey which is not showing up well it never does show up well that's the thing about wild honey I've seen other floss tubers show projects stitched on it and what I see on my screen is nothing like what it seems to look like to me in real life. So I'm going to try and describe it. It's a, it's pink, but it's not hit you in the head pink. It's a lighter pink with slightly peachy gray undertones. So it works really well as a background color. It's not a feature color. It just is there to make other colors look beautiful. And red and green in particular really pop on it. So I think it's a great, if somewhat unexpected pick for Christmas stitching because the colors just look so gorgeous on it, even though pink may not seem like what you would choose first thing for Christmas. So I will be using this truck again. I have another project I'm thinking of for a Christmas project I'm thinking of for Wild Honey. I love this fabric. And yeah, I just think Christmas colors look great on it. So I'm hoping to have this finished for next time. And I meant to ask you actually. So I was going to finish, well, I am going to finish this as a small rectangular pillow. The question is the edging. 
So my first thought was that I would do red beaded spiral rope stitch because I've really been enjoying that. I think it's beautiful. But then Brenda of Brenda and the Serial Starter at Brenda Sampler Stitcher on Instagram posted some finishes that she got back from her finisher Joy. And the first photograph in that post was Joy's finish of Hands Across the Sea. Annie Morris, which is a small sampler that was finished as a pillow and done with little beaded, I would call them picos, but they're really just beaded loops. If you haven't seen the post, I will link to it in the description. It was such a great finishing idea. I looked at that, I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to use that. And I was looking at this thinking, you know, maybe you don't need to put beaded spiral rope stitch on everything maybe this would be a great project to do the little beaded loops so what do you think spiral rope stitch or beaded pico loopy things i don't even know what that's called and then these are my threads i've got them in my little embroidery case because this is my current project and so I'll go balloons and swell 103. I'll put the colors in the description below. So that's la di da um, Merry Christmas sampler. I'm gonna have to start thinking about what comes next on the Christmas front. I have not decided yet. I've just got a pile of tarts sitting on my dining room table as I work my way through them. And actually, since I was speaking about stitching from stash, I do have a little haul to share this week because I was watching Nicola of Hands Across the Sea and she did her silk organization and storage little extra video and she showed the acrylic drawers to store spooled threads, which I thought was genius. So for my filament silks, of which I have larger collections, I do stuff like this, only they're just larger box tops and then they're sorted by color. So there's a tray for brown and a tray for blue and yada, yada, yada. But my Swall 103 collection has been growing as I have been using it more and doing more cross stitch and it was kind of an unorganized mess. So when she held up the drawers, I had to go straight to Amazon and shoom a monster trap. <gasps> Even when I'm not holding the spools up, I still find a way to drop them. Good lord. I can't believe that didn't go everywhere. So, as you can see, I haven't fully filled the chest. I have room to grow, and I do have some threads checked out from Stash right now for my ongoing projects, but I think that this is just beautiful. It's really practical. You can stack them three spools deep. So if you've got a pretty serious collection, that's a good one to buy. I'll put a link to this exact one in the description below. But as she said in her video, acrylic makeup drawers, I think was the search term that turned this one up. I feel like there was something else I was going to say about that, but I'm so disturbed by almost dumping all my 103 out on the floor that I'm going to take that as a sign to move on. Yeah. Oh boy. So then those are my Christmas whips that I have. And then we'll move on to the first of the Marie Antoinette Smalls. I detailed the whole idea behind this series, and I think that was episode 11 where I talked about stitchy plans if you are new to my channel. So this is the bottom band from Hands Across the Sea, Jane Marshall, which I have worked as the edge of a pink keep on Legacy Line 45 count Fuller's Teasel. And again, you're probably looking at this going, uh, Katie, how is that a whip? That looks pretty finished to me. And it is mostly finished, but it's missing the beaded trim. I am going to do um, pink crystal spiral rope stitch at top and bottom here, which I think will really finish this off nicely and kind of just 
bring all the elements together. Right now the top is just kind of hanging out. It doesn't look like a complete design thought to me and I think the trim will help better integrate all the elements here. So I did make a few changes from the pattern. So you can see on Jane Marshall, the centers have a dark color here, which is a very dark gray. And I started with that, but as I was looking at it, it's necessary on Jane Marshall because it helps tie the entire thing together. It keeps it from being a little too twee. And you really have to hand it to Jane Marshall for having a pretty sophisticated color understanding at age 10, which is definitely better than me at that age. But this is supposed to be light and frothy Sofia Coppola, Marie Antoinette, macarons and silks and beautiful things, you know, uncut by any sharper note. So I thought that just the lighter, brighter colors were adequate here. And so I used the Swasser Fiends without called for swath surfings without that dark gray and then just filled in where the gray was with pink and yellow and accented the centers with a tiny little yellow crystal and what's amazing is that I did not actually plan for the called for swath surfing and the silk to match that was just a very happy happy accident and this was finished using Vanna Pfeiffer, the Twisted Stitchers drum finishing tutorial. So this is just a very tiny, very squat little drum. And there is some puckering around the silk top at the edge because the silk was very, very thin and it didn't love being gathered. And I actually left it there because this is going to be hidden by the crystal beaded trim. Once I get this on, you are not gonna see that at all, but there is a little puckering messing up the finishing right now. And I think that's just a good object lesson in finishing. Not every single element of your finishing has to be perfect for you to get something that looks really good. By the time we get the trim on here, you're not ever gonna know that there were any blips in the finishing at all. It should look entirely smooth and like a very elegant little pin cushion. So this will be the first completed small in my Marie Antoinette series. And then to go with that, I have started the second piece from my Marie Antoinette series, which will be a scissors keep worked on the same beautiful silk, which was kind of part of my animating idea for this project. I bought that for something else and it just sparked all kinds of ideas in me. So on the scissors keep, this, I'll show you my design first. So it's going to have beaded and sequined elements at the edges. So everything you're seeing, kind of the filler towards the edges is gonna to be tonal leaves and then two central flowers. And then I'll do something at the edges, but I haven't quite figured that out yet. So I've got here my multiple drafts. I like to draft on tracing paper because you can easily move elements between drafts. So that's my first initial sketch. And then I started to fine it out um, to draw the elements as I wanted them. So there I've just kind of got to like, bleh. and then there it's actually starting to take shape as a flower. I'm moving around the edge, trying to get the right amount of negative space between all of these elements, making notes on technique. And then that was finally worked into a pen transfer drawing, which isn't fully filled in because I never trace everything in the design onto my ground fabric so that I can give myself room to maneuver. And then this is my start. And this is very unambiguously a whip because I have three sequined florets and that's it so far. 
I'm going to work outside in on this because I have a good idea of what the greens look like, but I'm still deciding on the color of the flowers. So the idea of the Marie Antoinette Smalls is that I have a set of objects to go in a stay-at-home sewing box that look like they belong together, but they don't match. So, you know, I'm sure you've all seen sewing accessories where they were clearly designed as a matched set. These are not matched pieces. They're just meant to complement each other. They're some a friend of mine says they're meant to look like they're singing from the same hymnal and that's really I think an excellent phrase. So they should go together, but it's not the same design repeated over and over. And this is what I'm thinking about. So I showed you my design first because I would actually like some second opinions on this. I think people, you know, outside eyes can see things that you yourself cannot always see when you are really close to a project. It's always been my experience. So please tell me what you think about my choices on the flower. So when I'm designing, I pull all the materials that I'm thinking about. Not everything here will ultimately be used. So on my back, I've got, this is the ground fabric. On the bottom, these are all the greens I've pulled as totally consistent in a range of different threads and colors. Again, they won't all get used. Some beads, some crystals, some specialty threads. These are silk wrapped pearls, which we'll talk about in a future episode sequins and then these are my potential flower colors. So I'll explain to you what I'm thinking here. First choice are yellows. Second choice would be these darker very blue pinks. Ooh, those are that's more what they look like. They are luscious, but they're a little darker in tone than the other objects in this series, and that's kind of what's giving me pause about these. Otherwise, I think I would take these and run with them because they're just stunning colors. These are Trebizond or these. These are lighter pinks that are more in the usual range of pinks that I work with. The lighter one here, it's the same pink that I used in this flower in the Russian Posy, which was originally made as a standalone, but I think the colors go so beautifully with the fabric that this will get moved into the Marie Antoinette Smalls and live in my stay-at-home sewing box. So. I'm currently leaning towards the lighter pinks because they go really well with what I think are going to be the greens I use most. Matches a great crystal color called Chrysoprase. I think these are gorgeous. But I'm still thinking about it and would love some feedback so tell me what you think in the comments and what is your reasoning because that's often just as important as the conclusion itself it can awaken you to something that you hadn't seen in the design and i'm telling all of you all of this and showing you my sketches and trying to take you inside the design process to show that it's not a straight line. Um, so in my previous episode, I showed you this, which was my pile of what I called reject beads. And that was kind of a misnomer. Somebody remarked in the comments that even my failures were beautiful. And the thing is, they're not really failures. Um, technically, they're perfectly well done. I don't keep my actual failures <laughs> around the house. I keep things that were just fine, but were wrong for the project I wanted them for. So that's why I call them reject beads. But the thing is, these are all lovely little pieces and I keep them because they can be useful for other things. So sometimes when I have been hard up for a gift at the last minute, I go into 
my reject pile, I pull a few things out, I pull them into a little posy, and then I have a gift that I've already done most of the work for. And so I just want to kind of show you how the sausage gets made, that although you can end up with something that's beautiful and looks like it was planned this way and turned out exactly as you ex intended it, there are a lot of twists and turns around the journey. So when I, as I continue stitching this, it could go different ways. I could hit on the right colors to start with, and this would be a pretty quick stitch. It's quite small. I don't have very time intensive techniques in mind for this. So this could either be a very quick stitch, it could be a slightly longer stitch, or it could be a very long stitch if say, I pick the pinks for this flowers and then I don't really like them. So I cut them out and I do something else, but I don't actually like that either. So then I start adjusting the colors of the leaves to go with the changes I've made in the flowers. And I'm rambling, but my point is that when you look at a finish, it usually had to go through a lot of phases to get there. And so like on the Russian Posy, I show you this and I think this is a beautiful finish, but there were a lot of discards that got me to this point. I hit on the right idea by cycling through several of the wrong ideas first. So as I show you the things that I work on, I'm trying to show you the flaws too and the things that don't necessarily do wrong, they're just things that aren't right for this particular project, so they have to be redone. And that's my long <laughs> rambling discourse on design. I'm sorry, I think that was probably more than you wanted to know, but I said it anyways, and it will be pertinent in the next episode. So this is kind of a preview. You actually may not want to watch the next episode after listening to all of that, but I hope you'll stick with me. And so these are a lot of specialty threads. Um, there's a mix in here of Goblin, Soie de Paris, Soie Perle, Trebizond, and then some really specialty threads like Double Twist Gimp. not focusing. There. And silk wrapped pearl, which is essentially a silk coil with which you can do some really amazing things. And that brings me to a request I had a while back. And I keep meaning to um, bring this up and forgetting about it. I just always have more to talk about and I can't keep track of it all. But I was asked in the comments a few episodes back about a tutorial on specialty threads. What are the different threads and what are they good for was the thrust of the request. So three I've got pulled for the scissors keep are Soie de Paris from Avera Soie, Trebizond, which is made and imported by Access Commodities, and Avera Soie, Soie Goblins, which you've heard me talk about a great deal here in the past for cross stitch. These are all different threads of different weights with different characteristics. So what was requested was a tutorial on different specialty threads and what are they good for? What counts can you use them for? Are they good for cross stitch? What do they do well? because they do use a very wide variety of threads, not just the stitchable specialty threads, but some of the really fun and crazy stuff like double twist skin. So my question for you today, and it's just my other questions, is one, does that sound like something that's interesting to you, a tutorial on specialty threads and their uses? And two, if the answer to that is yes, what do you want to know about these threads? So 
let me know what you think in the comments. And speaking of tutorials, the latest Simple Harmony tutorial is up, which is on the layout of the back and sides. We do have some people who are getting close to that point, and I would like to answer a question that has been asked a couple times, so I think there are probably other people wondering this, and it is about batting or padding on the Simple Harmony box. So the question that's been asked is, can you insert a thin layer of batting or felt in between your stitching and the backing paper? And the answer to that is no, for two reasons. The first is it would throw off the fit. The pattern is very carefully engineered to fit the box exactly. It's why you have to use the exact linen, Legacy Linen 37 count Russian tea cake and not another 37 count, which may not fit the exact same way, and why you have to use the exact box specified. So the extra bulk that the padding would add would drastically alter the fit of the pattern on the box and you'd have to re-engineer it, which is not something you wanna do. And the other reason is that padding is highly absorbent. The glue will not bond properly if you put a layer of either batting or felt in between your stitching and your paper. Linen or silk satin or another embroidery fabric will bond very well to paper given the correct conditions. If you put something super absorbent like felt or batting in between those layers, it's just going to soak up all the glue like a sponge. You're not going to get a good bond and your resulting finish will be messy. So for two very good reasons, please don't do it. Um, follow the process exactly as it's being outlined in the Simple Harmony tutorials and you will get a good result. It can be daunting to do a glued finish for the first time, but that's why there are so many tutorials and why they're highly detailed. I'm walking you through all of the mistakes I've made in the past to ensure that you don't make the same ones and that you get a good finish on your box without having to go through all of my various vicissitudes. So the most recent tutorial posted is the layouts of the back and sides. And then the next one is the first tutorial on getting your embroidery on the box. It's on blocking and preparing your embroidery for gluing. That will be up late next week. So that's the next tutorial that's coming. And then in the next episode of my Floss 2, which will be in two weeks, we are going to look at my very big whip that was not included in today's whip party. It's my current casket panel and I am going to show you what I've done, what I'm doing, what I will be doing, and we'll also talk about the process of a casket because the thing is, stitching a casket is not really that different from stitching a sampler and you're probably listening to this going, you're nuts. But it's true, and in the next episode, I will show you why that's the case. So that's, I think, pretty much all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed the whip party. I'm not sure I had a sufficiently party atmosphere. Maybe I like, should have had a party hat on. But I hope you enjoyed it anyways. I will see you next time for the really big whip. There will be another Simple Harmony tutorial posted in between those two. Oh, that also reminds me of another question I have had on how long will it be at the attic? At least until the end of February. An end date hasn't been set yet, but definitely no earlier than March 1st. So it'll be back here at some point, but Jean's been busy and we just haven't worked that out yet. So I will see you again in two weeks. I hope you'll join me. I'm really excited to share this panel with you. It's turning out beautifully. I'm loving the colors on it. I'm really excited to share it. 
And until then, happy stitching.